one of my favorite FOIA documents, which I thought was the most ironic thing, was the North Carolina Department of Agriculture saying, Susan Thixon ain't nothing better than a snake oil salesman. And I'm like, that's an interesting analogy, seeing <laughs> Susan uh, might be off topic, but with CBD, CBD comes about and they all get together and they have to figure out how we're going to do this and all this kind of stuff. Like when raw pet food came about, for example, they didn't, I don't, I have not seen evidence of them doing the same thing. So it's like with CBD, they're kind of taking their time and doing these public meetings and, you know, they're doing things differently to try to regulate that. But with other aspects of the pet food industry, they come up with opinions and they're like, well, we'll just go with an opinion. I don't know if you've seen that as well, or if you would understand why they do one thing differently than the other, why they're inconsistent? I, I think it's whatever atmospheric conditions affect them that day. It, 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 you know, that's what AFCO should be all about. That's what they claim to be all about is to have uniform regulations in, in every U.S. state. Um, but we don't have that. They, they've been in operation for over 100 years. And we still don't have uniform regulations and uniform enforcement of law. One state will uh, allow something, another state throws a hissy fit over, you know, one word on a label. It, it's, it's inconsistent. So it does leave you with that impression because they're so reserved, because they won't answer our questions, we have to make a lot of assumptions. So when things like that happen, it does give you the impression um, that, that they do whatever they want, not what law um, requires, uh, not what their mission statement claims that, that the goal of AFCO is for. It, it does give you that feeling that, you know, it's whatever suits their fancy. And so then that leads into the darker side of going, are they paid off? You know, are, are, does industry slip them a fat white envelope under the table and say, you know, I need this definition to, to get through, or I need this definition to be stalled? We don't know. That is, that is totally an assumption on my part, but because they shut us out because everything is behind closed doors, because they won't answer our questions, because we're villainized. Yeah, you just about can't help from going to the dark side wondering. I have seen time and time again, and the worst was when the meeting was in New Orleans, um, that after the meetings are done, if you sit in the lobby of the hotel, you can watch going out the front door to go to bars and restaurants, um, AFCO and industry, you know, right in a group. They're all going together. Let's go here um, at an AFCO meeting once. Uh, the front of the table where the, the committee members, AFCO and FDA members, uh, sit is a draped meeting table. And then the rest of the room is rows and rows of chairs. Um, at, after a meeting, I happened to go up, I had a question for an FDA, the microbiologist from FDA. I had a question for her, so I was standing there waiting to get to ask her that question. And I see the AFCO chair of this committee um, a State Department of Agriculture representative holler, okay, um, and this was a trade association, um, the, the head person from this trade association, industry trade association, okay, it, it's, we're done now, it's time to party, and he said her name, and he pulls out from underneath of the table a case of Corona beer. Now, he didn't call over another AFCO member, another regulatory person. He called over industry and said, here's our case of beer. Uh, I did talk to the guy afterwards and say, you know, you should not be socializing with industry. I'm sorry, but you accepted a job of being a state feed official 
and participating in AFCO. So that should cut your ties to socially hang out with industry. You, you have a role and you can't do that. Uh, I have to give FDA credit. I, I never see FDA uh, socializing with industry. I really don't. Uh, and I don't give FDA credit very often, but I'll give them credit for that. But the state feed people, you can see it at any meeting. FDA did shut down pretty much all of my FOIA requests, so I'm taking that credit back. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. When you started going to these meetings, so the, if you could go back to the first few meetings in your mind, what was it like walking into that room? And how did people treat you initially? And how has that changed over the years, if it's changed at all? Um, it's, it's just gotten worse. Um, it was it, the, the walking into the lion's den. It, it truly was. It was very intimidating. Um, I was the only person on our side there. And at my very first meeting, I did ask FDA, this was Dr. Dan McChesney, who used to be the uh, Center for Veterinary Medicine uh, Director of Surveillance and Compliance, and I asked him about the compliance policies allowing diseased animals and animals that have died other than by slaughter into pet food. And he brushed it off and acted like they didn't exist was his initial response. And then I went, uh, I, I've got, and I had printed them out and had them with me. Uh, and I said, I've got them right here. They do exist. And how can you do that since it's, you know, a, a direct opposite of federal law. And, and he, his only response was, well, we'll have to agree to disagree. That was it. Um, they never have um, been friendly. Uh, a few of them, now I have to say, a few of them are human and, and they have been at this last meeting um, or at the meeting when we uh, were kicked out when consumers and consumer representatives were kicked out, refused admission uh, to AFCO for something we had absolutely nothing to do with. Um, when we got in, a few of the AFCO members did say to me, you know, away from everybody else, they were really glad I was there. So there are some humans, you know, that are good in AFCO, but the majority of the people um, not only call us a snake oil salesman, but they treat us like that as well. Hmm. Well, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's too much <laughs> to talk about in one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a few more. And we'll wrap it up. Um, okay. I knew we would be able to just keep talking and talking. And talking. <laughs> <laughs> so over the years, there have been certain, when you say members, state department officials that appear to understand your arguments and concerns. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, but they're not Linda, voicing them in the same way that you are. They're just sort of silent or are they voicing them? Well, um, Richard Tenick, who is Oregon Department of Agriculture um, and the chair of the Ingredient Definitions Committee, I, they were defining human grade. And I said, I made the suggestion, well, you have to define feed grade. That's if you're going to define human grade, you have to define feed grade and industry and other regulatory authorities said, no, no, we don't. And Richard, as the chair said, yeah, we do. That's only right. She's right. We have to define it. And he overruled them. So yeah, there, there have been those instances. And Richard is one that, that I can say, is fair. We might not always agree on things, but I can, I can always say that he has been fair. He will listen to your argument and genuinely listen, not just sit there and stare at you with eyes glazed over. Um, he will genuinely listen and, and 
look at it from an even playing field, but there's not many that, that do that. Have you ever had a conversation with or seen any federal or state employee raise concern that these meetings are stifling consumer or citizen voices or dissent? Never, never. They, they in my opinion, in my very bad attitude opinion, they could care less about having consumers there. They could care less about consumer opinion. They believe they know better. We know, we know what's best for you. We, so just don't come here and slow us down because we're smarter than you and we know more than you. And they don't want our opinion, no. And the reality check on that is that's not the way democracy works. So that is that's right. why this yeah. conversation is happening. No. Uh, now, when it comes to the future of AFCO, should AFCO not exist or should we instead get a public version of what AFCO is doing? And do you think AVCO will ever go away? Well, we have to have some type of system to um, write definitions of ingredients, update definitions of ingredients, write labeling laws, so forth. We do have to have something. Uh, to me, it should be done at a federal level and the states should be required to uniformly accept these. So to me, it should be State Department of Agriculture representatives twice a year um, go to a meeting hosted by FDA. Since it's interstate. And everybody goes to DC. Yeah, everybody goes to DC. They have meeting rooms or they can, you know, have the same kind of meeting rooms at a hotel that AFCO does. And it is a public forum. Everyone is welcome to attend. You have to go to DC, but everyone is welcome. And any rulemaking decision goes into the Federal Register asking for comment, just like it's done for everything else. Um, I mean, this is a, an, a very important topic, not only for pet food, but for animal food, because it's what becomes human food down the road. Um, so it, it all needs to be public and, and everyone needs to be able to provide input. It might slow definitions down a little bit, but probably not. It'll probably be about the same because AFCO takes, you know, forever. It takes years for a definition to finally make it into the book to be a final definition. But regardless of the time that it takes, it should be done legally. And the way it's being done now um, it is not in, in the public interest and, and it is not legal. Laws should all be public. The lawmaking process should all be public. And it may improve health as well, because if citizens are ensuring that potentially toxic or adverse ingredients are not allowable into pet food, what may that do for the positive benefits of the animals consuming that feed or that pet feed? Yeah, I think a lot of practicing veterinarians are under the assumption that, you know, they can't even go to AFCO. It's not allowed. It's a private thing and they can't even go. And I think if it was, if it was hosted by FDA and the regulatory members of the states attend and it's, it's presented as a public event. I think we would see more practicing veterinarians attend who, who day to day deal with the health conditions linked to a pet food. And they would go and be able to provide really necessary input to these decision makers. And the, and the voting and so forth can all be the same as it is now. It's only regulatory that gets to vote yay or nay on, on something. So that can all stay the same, but if, if it's in a public forum, 
at least they're they're you know setting the stage for fairness and and le legal foundation for this whole process. I often come across in my research veterinarians who will say, "Well, follow the AVCO guidelines," or they'll refer a consumer to a food that meets the AVCO guidelines, but that same veterinarian has never been to an AVCO meeting. And yeah. in most cases, from what I observe, that veterinarian has no clue what AVCO really does and what is involved. I have only seen one veterinarian at the AVCO meeting that I've been to, but I've only been to one. I feel like I mean, I work too hard for my money and it's like giving money to a mob. That's how I feel yeah. attending that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are other veterinarians there, either from the state or from pet food companies. Um, are there a lot of veterinarians there or not too many? Well, um, uh, Kathy, Dr. Kathy Alanovi, uh, Dr. Karen Becker and Dr. Judy Morgan are, are it that, that I'm aware of. Um, in regards and, and, to practicing or yeah but I, th I I agree with you I think most veterinarians practicing veterinarians they have no clue what AFCO is they, they and, and AFCO AFCO did a survey uh, of consumers they paid a lot of money uh, when they want to survey industry they go to the industry trade organizations um, when they want to survey consumers they did not go to the uh, industry or the consumer uh, stakeholder association. They paid for uh, consumer surveys. And they were very surprised that when it, it says AFCO on a bag of pet food meets AFCO nutrition, nutritional profiles for complete and balanced, that, that no pet owner knew what AFCO was. Well, how, why would they be surprised at that? You know, I, I was shocked that that surprised them. Of course they don't know, because you all had it. You, you know, who can pay $500 twice a year just to walk in the door, nevertheless, airfare, hotel, meals, everything else um, to come to this um, and, and, you know, participate behind closed doors. So, um, yeah, I completely agree. But I think, again, if we move this to a public forum hosted by FDA, then it, it could change a lot. It could change a lot. I agree. And some things that I've, I mean, this will be the last question because, I mean, we could go for seven hours. This is a <laughs> seven-hour podcast with Susan Thixton. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. She's going to shower now, and she'll be back in an hour. Um, <laughs> When looking into states and FDA, I have seen that the FDA provides grant money to AFCO and states are trying to say, well, we're not paid by AFCO. So their salary is not being paid by AFCO. We're just participating and volunteering our time. So they're trying to get that loophole to say that they're just participating, but they're doing work for AFCO voluntarily while they are on their public department of agriculture time. So during their nine to five day jobs, they're doing work being paid, not by AFCO, but by their department of agriculture in their state or the FDA to then do work for AFCO that's private, that is then copywritten. So we do have public employees doing work on public employee time that is then copywritten ultimately by a private association and then adapted into law, try to keep up here, adapted into <laughs> law, which they say citizens can't have access to because it's copywritten. So it's this sort of, I used to say it was a perfect circle, but now I see that the circle's kind of broken. It sort of goes in an almost complete circle until they adapt the copywritten material into law. That's where the problem sits. And certain employees have done business for AFCO through private email addresses, and that is illegal and yeah. to be litigated in the future, I believe. Yeah. Um, but well, so on, on, on FDA paying 
AFCO members, the, the program they established not too many years ago either is called the Animal Feed Regulatory Program Standards. And uh, on the face of this organization, it, um, it was uh, an agreement between FDA and AFCO to start this organization. And FDA provides funding to states that become members. And they have a standard of how um, investigations should be performed, uh, laboratory standards, uh, and adopting laws that are the same as the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And as example, California has been paid, if I'm remembering correctly, $4 million over like three years. Now this is taxpayer money, okay? This is part of FDA's budget. They're paying California to participate in the Animal Feed Regulatory Program standards. And they pay like 23 other states about the same amount of money every year. Um, but we still don't have uniform enforcement of law. We, we, you know, nothing is the same. So California in particular, uh, California, there was a human grade pet food manufacturer that manufactures in California, their company is located, uh, is based in Texas. But California just on a whim, shut this human grade pet food down. They, they before their license, had expired, they sent the company an email and said, um, we will not renew your license. You can't make human grade pet food claims in California. Um, we are, you can't make any more pet food from today on, even though their existing license hadn't even expired. So since they were a member of the Animal Feed Regulatory Program Standards, FDA, they're supposed to have the same mindset, rules, everything as FDA. FDA acknowledges human grade pet food. FDA is who originally defined human grade pet food. I wrote FDA an email and said, California needs to pay all their money back to you because they're a member. You've paid them $4 million and they're not abiding by the standard. And FDA wrote back and said, oh, it's, it's just voluntary. It, it's voluntary if they want to participate. They still get paid one way or another. They still get their $4 million, but they don't, they're not required to have uniform enforcement of law. So it makes it even crazier. That, that ramps up the crazy another notch because the FDA is paying them, yet California can go do whatever it wanted. We did finally get, and it was a multitude of people working on this, we did get California to change their minds. How absurd of them to prevent the, the manufacture of a human grade pet food made in a human food facility with a USDA inspector on site, but, um, Anyway, it, that's the whole point is that there, there's no uniformity, even though they're paid for everything to be uniform, it's still not uniform. And even beyond that, they are paying grant money to the individual private association, FDA is, to hold AFCO meetings. So yeah. it yes. makes no sense that they can't have the same thing from a federal standpoint, if they're yeah. rolling out money through those grants and this grant and... You know, yeah. apparently there's enough money to go around for them to, you know, do quite a lot. Yeah. Except for do their job in a lot of sense, which is pass actual regulations publicly. That's the sort of elephant in the room here is that if you raise a legitimate concern about this stuff, then they will argue it's them trying to do their job. But the argument here being made is that the job is being done not in a public forum, and it should be, so... Anyways, well, Susan, I appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot more in the future.